Okay, Adab, uh, welcome to uh, Islam After Colonialism, a uh, series that's uh, sponsored by the University of Exeter's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies uh, and Habib University's Department of Comparative Liberal Studies, uh, now renamed the Program of Comparative Humanities. Uh, for those who are uh, might be watching this for the first time, uh, I'd like to give a brief introduction to the series. Uh, and what motivates it. So across the world, uh, modern colonial rule has not only uh, devastated the economies and ecologies of non-Western societies, it has dramatically transformed their cultures and traditions in innumerable ways. From the replacement of metaphysics and spirituality and ethics by historical and political religions uh, in the form of nation states in particular, to the emergence of divisive nationalism and nation states, the contemporary world cannot be understood without the profound impact of modern white supremacist colonial rule based on modern ideas of racial and cultural segregation, historical superiority, and the civilizing mission, as well as national competition for global power and progress. Habib University's Department of Comparative Liberal Studies and the University of Exeter's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies have launched a fortnightly webinar series to explore not only the radical transformation of regional Islam uh, during the period of modern apartheid colonial rule, but also the living potentials of the pre-colonial past, as well as the urgent decolonial question of what is possible today, what can we do, and how can we live now? Uh, and with that brief introduction, I'll ask my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Sajjad Rizvi from the University of Exeter, uh, to introduce our speaker for today. Over to you, Sajjad. Thank you, Norman. Um, welcome everyone uh, to the second uh, of uh, the series uh, this term. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague at Exeter uh, from the Department of Politics, uh, Dr. Farah Mehla. Um, and she um, is a specialist on <clears throat> she's a specialist on the uh, the intersections uh, between conflict, religion, and justice. She uh, did her PhD on um, uh, conflict, uh, politics, uh, ethnicity in the Sri Lankan context in particular. She's also worked on uh, international human rights and uh, trying to make sense of how in different minority and post-war um, context, uh, people deal with the search for justice. Uh, and so in a sense, uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at uh, perhaps a, an element of the, uh, the Muslim South Asian context, which is often um, missed and ignored, which is, is Sri Lanka in particular. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to this and I hope there will be plenty of interesting uh, discussions which will arise uh, from uh, Farah's paper. So without further ado, I will invite uh, Farah to, to begin. Thank you very much, Sajad, and thank you um, to the organizers, both the Institute for Arab and Islamic Studies at Exeter and Habib University for inviting me to make this presentation. Thank you also for taking the trouble to focus on Sri Lanka, where as you well did say very well, Sajad is uh, to be neglected in the discussions on Muslim minorities and on Islam as well. So let me start um, with a brief introduction about the Muslim population in Sri Lanka. I am using some slides, but I, as we are all you know, new to navigating between online presentations and reading our scripts, I've asked Sajid to kindly share them with you. Um, so we start with, um, Sajid, we can start with the first slide, please. Thank you. So Sri Lanka has a 9% Muslim population. The majority are Sunni um, of the Safi sect. Um, if you can move on to the second slide, Sajid. The majority population in Sri Lanka are Sinhalese in ethnicity and Buddhist in religion. So I've put some population statistics there for you to get a better sense. The largest minority are Tamils in ethnicity. There is a small percentage of Christians who are Sinhalese and Tamil in ethnicity. So it has a slightly complex uh, breakdown in terms of ethnicity and religion. 
Muslims live across the country with a large concentration in the East and the capital Colombo. Um, if you could move on to the next slide, please, of the maps. If you have a look at these maps, you can see that the, on the one on the left, the black part is where you have ethnic minority Tamils, which is considered their homeland, the North and East, and the rest is where the majority community live. And you can see in both maps where Muslims live, you see there um, in the left-hand map, it's on it's merged with yellow, where it all goes a bit sort of pinky, orangey, peach, which indicates to you that Muslims are living in in the majority Sinhalese or Tamil areas. So they're, they're not a majority in any area. They live um, together with the other religious and ethnic groups. Muslims are both an ethnic and religious group. The form identity, which even though problematic and contested is unnegotiable to them. This categorization and classification of group identity was a colonial invention solidified by the British, and I will argue in this paper that its legacy has shaped Islam and Muslim identity in independent Sri Lanka. Muslims in Sri Lanka are presently facing a host of issues and, in, and their contemporary context, I would say is probably the most challenging since independence. Many factors have contributed to this situation, it's very calamitous position therein, and I will present some of them though not get into detail of them because I want to keep my focus on the colonial legacy. So let me start with a brief introduction on the current situation for Muslims. Much of Sri Lanka's independent history has been plagued by armed conflict between the country's military and Tamil militants who are fighting for a separate homeland for ethnic minority Tamils in the country's north and east. The armed conflict ended in 2009 with the elimination of the senior leadership of the main Tamil militant group. Following the end of the armed conflicts, Muslims began to be framed as the new enemy. This position is based on largely two factors. The first is that Muslims are seen as a threat to Tamils and Sinhalese, so to Tamil nationalism and Sinhalese nationalism. As Muslims constitute a sizable population in the North and East, their quest for political autonomy in what Tamils consider as their homeland Combined with the contrasting position they have on post-war justice, challenges Tamil nationalist positions. So um, in the case of Muslims, many of the violations they faced during the conflict were perpetrated by Tamil militants, whereas government forces were responsible for atrocities faced by Tamils. And this contention um, affects Muslims' relationship with Tamil nationalism. With the defeat of Tamils in 2009, as the remaining affluent ethnic minority group, they are seen as a threat by Sinhalese nationalists. Muslims are also seen as uh, divisive, self-serving, and detached from other groups based on their shift toward the strict form of Islam, often interpreted as Islamic extremism. This became further exaggerated following the ISIS-inspired suicide attacks that took place in nine different places, primarily targeting Sri Lanka's Catholic population on Easter Sunday of 2019. This was the first time Muslims have been held responsible for a serious incident of organized violence. And you can imagine what that itself speaks a lot for uh, the position Muslims have been in. Popular perception of Muslims by other ethnic and religious groups, be they Buddhists, Tamils or Christians, is one of transgression caused by successive transformations in identity and religious practice. My research is a study of these changes that Muslims underwent since at least around the 1990s, which I will present here, was drawing analytical links with colonial legacies. I want to start by looking at the situation of Islam and Muslims during colonialism, because on uh, focusing on two specific events. The first is the mass migration of Muslims into the central hill country during the Dutch rule, this is subsidiary to my main thesis, but useful to develop part of my argument. The second is critical, and this is the Moor identity project that took place in the 19th century during British rule. I will then move on to assessing the effects of colonialism on Islam and Muslims in Sri Lanka. So if we can get on to the next slide, Sajid, please. Thank you. The origins of Muslims in Sri Lanka are unclear because the early history of the community has enjoyed poor attention in the country's main historical sources. The earliest mention of Arabs in Sri, in, um, Sri Lanka literary historical sources and the only reference for centuries to come refers to land set aside during the uh, reign of King Pandukabia, which was in the fifth century. Even in the pre-Islamic period, the Arabs were prominent in trade in, in, the, in the Indian Ocean region. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. There is substantial historical evidence of Arab settlements from around the 9th century, as many were visiting the country for trade and pilgrimage to Adam's Peak Mountain, which is considered a holy site because tradition has it that when Adam, who was the first prophet of Islam, was cast out of paradise, he first set foot there. Now, the next slide, please. Thank you. The Portuguese were the first, so that's a picture, sorry, of um, the Adam's Peak Mountain, and uh, it was a very popular uh, pilgrim site. The next one, please. Thank you. The Portuguese were the first European power to colonize Sri Lanka in 1505, and the Dutch took over from them in 1658. At the time the Portuguese first arrived in Sri Lanka, Muslims were in control of the ports in the southern coastal belt and had monopolized the whole export and import trade in the island. Portuguese referred to Muslim traders as Moros, but there is little indication in the historical sources that they were categorized as a specific group. Contemporary Sri Lankan Muslim historians deprecate the Portuguese and Dutch for economic policies that they claim were aimed at stifling Muslim economic progress. In the early stages of Portuguese rule, trade restrictions were imposed by enforcing a monopoly over certain goods, which have been described by historians as ruinous for Muslims. The Dutch targeted Arab trading activities further through a series of additional taxation and restrictions according to historians, in the hope of eventually eliminating Muslim traders. Portuguese and Dutch persecution of Muslims was considered harshest in the religious sphere. Although in policy, the colonial powers were not supposed to engage in forced conversion, many of their practices appear to contradict this. A viceregal decree in December 1576 prohibited the name of Prophet Muhammad being invoked in the Muslim call for prayers from a mosque and stated that all sacred books such as the Quran should be seized and destroyed when never found. There are also historical records of Muslim mosques burnt down and burial grounds desecrated by the Portuguese. Now, something very interesting happened as a consequence of this persecution. Between the 17th and the 19th century, we see an exodus of Muslims moving, um, uh, moving to settle in the hill country, which was the Candian Kingdom, which remained under the rule of Buddhist kings. They were settled by Buddhist kings in the eastern part of Sri Lanka, where they engaged in agriculture which would have meant a complete transformation in profession and status. So previously they were traders and shifted into becoming uh, farmers. Lorna Devaraja, one of Sri Lanka's foremost Muslim historians, describes these events as a form of cultural assimilation, where Muslims took official duties as part of the Candian feudal system on temple lands, where they served the Buddhist temples by engaging in several religious cultural roles. Um, Sajid, so could you shift to slide, please? So this is a quote from um, the Dutch rule, just to explain how um, some of the issues that Muslims faced. And the next slide, please. Okay, I will come to explaining this now. This picture depicts a pageant in the Candian Kingdom uh, during the, it's a sketch actually, of a Buddhist religious pageant that takes place outside what is known as the Temple of the Tooth. The Temple of the Tooth is a temple which uh, is believed to host the tooth of, uh, the, of Lord Buddha. And this pageant is a procession where once a year, the tooth is carried through the town. And this is just an indication to show you how, the kind of religious cultural roles that Muslims who moved in the Candian Kingdom through the caste system the kind of Buddhist pra cultural practices that they would have taken over um, as a result of this exodus. Now, Devaraja explains this as an attempt by Muslims to protect what she describes as the Ummah or the religious community. But it is questionable whether the religious or economical motive was a dominant factor, considering that the compromise involved moving away from a monotheistic ruler to taking on these polytheistic Buddhist roles, religious and cultural, in the Candian kingdom. The significance of this change to composition of religious character I will discuss in more detail later, as I now want to focus on the more important historical event concerning Muslims, which is the Ethnic Identity Formation Project. 19th century Sri Lanka was marked by revivalist movements across three main identity groups, which amongst the majority Sinhalese and the largest minority Tamils, developed into competing nationalisms. 
Muslims were also engaged in revivalist movements, which were far weaker than the other two and mainly focused on developing education within the community. The Muslim revivalist movement was eventually hijacked by a debate on ethnicity, and ironically by a Tamil, Ponambalam Ramanathan, a representative in the Legislative Council. If you can switch the slide, from, slide for me, please, Sajid. Thank you. So that is um, a quote from him. And in, to put it in simple, what uh, Ponambalam Ramanathan said in 1885 was that Muslims are Tamil in ethnicity and they converted to Islam. Incapacitated by a lack of clear political leadership, the Muslim response took um, up nearly 20 years and it came from the community's main political thinker, ILM Abdul Aziz who in 1907, in a criticism of Mr. Ramanathan's ethnology of the Moors, made the following case. Next slide, please. Thank you. So if you read this, you can, you'll can you notice that um, what ILM Abdulaziz has done here is firstly, he has uh, created a, an, an identity calling Muslims at the time Moors, and he, claims that Moors have an Arab origin, that they came from Arabia. And he differ, he makes this classification of them being a Ceylon Moors, and they are of such elite origin that they are in fact from the family or the uh, Hashemite clan. Sri Lanka's existing narrative of Muslim history has been constructed largely on the arguments posed in this Ramanath and Aziz exchange. From that point, Muslim ethnic identity began to be fashioned around an emphasis on the distinct Arab origins and heritage of Ceylon Moors as against coast Moors, who were supposedly of Indian origin, and the Malays, who were also Muslim, but originated from the Malay Peninsula brought in much later to the country by the British. Consequently, Muslim identity became delinked from aspects of Indian and Tamil religion and culture, and the Arab link began to be displayed primarily through dress and other forms of culture and social change. Could you switch the slide, please? So here you will see that what happened during this time is you had uh, uh, many different um, social organizations, cultural, religious organizations, such as the Moor Islamic Cultural Home, um, under this identity of Moors being created. And you can see from these photographs of the leading Muslim men at the time, the Muslim community leaders, they took on this, what was known as a Fez cap. Um, it was a symbol of their Arab identity, their Arab origin. The British accepted the claim by Muslim elites and created a new ethnic category titled Moors, who were divided into two groups, Ceylon Moors, supposedly of Arab origins, and Indian Moors of Indian origin. As scholars such as Kadri Ismail and Zakaria and Chamukratnam have explained, these categories are highly problematic as they were largely based on claims of origin that were ambiguous and difficult to establish. Additionally, they were gendered, discounting the fact that Muslim traders married local women. After independence, this more identity, possibly because it was so weakly established, lost credence and members of the group referred to themselves as Muslims, even in reference to, the, to their ethnicity. If you go around Sri Lanka and you speak to a Muslim person and you ask them their identity now, very few, no one will really call themselves more. They will all say they're Muslims. And if you say Muslims can't be an ethnic category, it's a religious category, it doesn't matter to them. They'll refer to themselves as Muslims. But in official forms, census statistics, the term more, Ceylon more, Indian more, and Malay continue to be used. As a result of this formal classification and categorization by the British, Muslims, became the third largest ethnic group, placed in a complex position between two dominant and competing ethno-nationalisms, Sinhalese and Tamils. Both, not long after independence, entered into conflict. Next slide, please. If you look at here, there's some quotes which reflect um, the complexity in the Muslim position divided between the Sinhalese and Tamils. Uh, at the time when Sinhalese rulers tried to make Sinhalese the official language. In the run-up to the ethnic conflict, Muslim leaders found their allegiance divided between Sinhalese and Tamils. Those living in the Tamil-speaking areas of the North and East were keen to support Tamil political interests, but were overpowered by those in the South who strongly aligned with the Sinhalese Buddhist ruling elites. In the late 70s, when Tamil militants started to fight the mainly Sinhala Buddhist military for a separate state for Tamils, in the country's north and east, 
Muslims living in these areas initially supported them. However, by the late 1980s, relations between militants and Muslims deteriorated, culminating in the ethnic cleansing of Muslims from the entire northern province. Now, I will not get into the details of the situation of Muslims during the armed conflict. The main, as the main focus of my presentation today is on the colonial legacy of Muslims in Islam. Next slide, please. Farzana Hanifa, Mirak Rahim, M.M. Nuhman, Dennis McGivray, amongst others, in their scholarly work have established the link between Muslim identity and politics and their precarious position as the third largest group often caught up between the contentious larger two. Muslims in independent Sri Lanka have been determined to carve out a distinct identity as separate from both the other groups. In the absence of narratives on origin, distinct sense of culture and language, the dominant defining factor has become Islam. My research has focused on two processes of identity and religious changes experienced by Muslims. The first during the armed conflict, which started around about the 1990s. And the second was after the war ended in 2009. The two processes see Muslims oscillating between ethnicity and religious identity, constantly shaping their position in response, in response to the ethnic and religious other. These processes of othering find their origins in colonial practice, strengthened particularly through British policy and practice of counting and categorizing subjects in the subcontinent and solidified through the production of identity groups. So let me start with outlining these changes that Muslims went through. The first change of, to identity and religious practice I want to highlight took place around the 1990s. It was evidence in the rapid and drastic shift, particularly in the dress code for women from uh, like traditional clothes like sari and salva kameez to the abaya and hijab and headscarf, right? So Sajjad, if you could change the slides. Thank you. So this would be a picture that shows you, it's kind of how Muslim women used to traditionally dress in Sri Lanka. And if you can go on to the next slide. So this is a picture that shows you how Muslim, most of most Muslim women look today. Islam became predominant in Muslim life and quickly became more institutionalized with the emergence of new Islamic schools, madrasas, financial institutions, social institutions. Combined with this, several Dawa and Islamic educational centers were established, offering courses in Arabic language, history, Islamic studies, Quranic recitation, and of course, the Sharia. These enable people to identify with and learn about Islam, whilst also embodying religious reform, for instance, by enforcing specific dress codes or permitting certain halal practices. Sharia compliance with more demand for halal products, including in banking and finance, gave way to an entire industry ranging from food clothes to banking products swamping the market. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is a picture of some of the institutions that emerged and, and the mosques that kept mushrooming everywhere around the country. This awakening to Islam was led by the three main religious movements that I studied for my PhD and I can talk a little bit about. The Tablighi Jamaat was the first, which is, a, as most of you will know, a global transnational Islamic reform movement originating in India, the Jamaat Islam which you'll also know very well, founded by Maududi. And then um, the second one, the third one is little less known because they're referred to in Sri Lanka as Tawheed. They're not really a movement. They're accumulation of different groups who go under the banner of Tawheed and broadly adhere to both Salafi and Wahhabi ideology. Now, each of these movements played a different role in uh, bringing about these religious changes. The Tablik Jamaat increased the numbers of mosque attendees and made Muslims more religiously conscious through its quiet missionary work. The Jamaat Islam with their ideology of Islam encompassing all areas of life contributed to introducing economic and social systems in line with Islam. The Tawhid movement played the most significant role in the process of what I describe as purifying Islam. The Tawhid groups were notoriously confrontational and aggressive in their approach. Now, they led this important dimension that took place on uh, while this religious reform process was happening, which involved a purification project based on Wahhabi Salafi ideology, calling for the removal of shirk or polytheistic practices and bidah or innovation from Muslim religious, cultural and social practices. Could you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So this will give you some sense of the practices that used to exist in Sri Lanka. The purification project mainly targeted the four big Sufi tariqas in Sri Lanka, the Naqshbandis, the Shadlis, the Qadriya, and Rifaya. 
The other spiritual or mystical leaders, they were, they're known as Maulanas and Bhavas in Sri Lanka, who not necessarily united, but had a very hegemonic position amongst Muslims in Sri Lanka. The purification project began scrutinizing and demanding the removal of many common practices. For example, recitation of mauluds, prayers, veneration of the birth and life of Prophet Muhammad was considered shrip because aspects of the text made divine association to him or to Sufi saints as was praying at the tombs of saints, many of which existed inside mosques. Aspects of Muslim weddings, funerals, coming of age celebrations were said to be innovations of bidda as they were not practiced by Prophet Muhammad and his followers in the same way. Mauluds and other religious texts were translated into local languages and deemed sinful and in contradiction of true Islam. There were several political, religious, and social economic factors that contributed to these changes. In the 1980s and 1990s, a large number of Sri Lankan Muslims went as migrant workers to the Middle East and returned with a different version of Islam. Many of those who I interviewed spoke of how in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, they were put into what they described as camps for Friday sermons and were, part, and were part of what appeared to be a very structured, organized form of indoctrination. Both states also actively funded madrasas and Islamic institutions and provided scholarships for a number of students. This influence combined with increased exposure to transnational Islam as a result of the higher social capital amongst Muslims drove some of these changes. Whilst acknowledging the numerous factors that contributed to these changes, I argue that what took place amongst Muslims during the conflict period was primarily a desire for separation from the other dominant ethnic groups. Aspects of these were noticeable during the 19th century identity construction project, where as already mentioned, claiming a more identity um, shunning Tamil culture was part of it. During this period, however, it was clear that the transformation to culture and identity were clearly led by elites. This is in the 19th century. And it was very much an identity construction project. The changes that took place in the 1990s during the armed conflict in Sri Lanka were far more widespread and were largely publicly embraced. The cleansing of Islam was always articulated and justified on the grounds that it had to be different from the other. Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, religious, cultural, and social practices, and replaced with what was described in inverted commas, I say, as pure Islam. In a context where Muslims were the second minority affected by the armed conflict, but not seen as a party to it, Muslims searched for a new and different identity, one that connected them with the global community and was based on religion, rather than a contentious ethnicity. But even as they did this, their own religious, cultural, and social practices were too closely associated with the ethnic and religious other, hence leading them to what I describe as their own separatist struggle. But unlike the Tamil one, the Muslim one was within the community, so internally, and took the form of a nonviolent process of cleansing Islam. So we fast forward now to 2009, after the war ended in 2009, Muslims began, became targets of religious violence and hate campaigns. In the early stages, incidents typically involved mob and arson attacks on religious shrines and places of worship, complemented by well-organized anti-Muslim social media campaigns. Could you switch the slide, please, Sajid? Thank you. So this is uh, some pictures of the type of violence that took place. This Hate campaigns were built on the core claim that Muslims, through population growth, religious conversions, and economic development, were planning to take over Sri Lanka. Muslim business establishments were targeted for attacks, as well as religious centers and mosques. The former on the basis that they were dominating the economy, and the latter because of their association to Islam, and occasionally on claims that they were involved in religious conversion. Next slide, please. By 2014, the violence turned into systematic organized racial attacks in Muslim neighborhoods. Heightened levels seen in 2014 and 2017 in southern Sri Lanka and 2018 in the central areas. And of course, after the Easter Sunday attacks, there were the most serious events of uh, violence that the country has seen for decades. These episodes of violence were led by Buddhist extremist groups, um, but clearly with state complicity. When it became evident that the violence against Muslims were organized, systematic, and enjoyed a level of state support, Muslim religious and community leaders converged and in a unified response condemned the incidents, calling on the government to protect Muslims and drawing international attention to the violations they faced. 
However, in private, they engaged in a process of introspection and generally concluded that Muslims had breached the boundaries of minority status and some of the activities had provoked the Buddhist response. One community leader, for example, told me we were in a minority behaving like a majority. Muslim leaders concluded that in identifying strictly with Islam in the previous phase of reform, they had firstly compromised on their national identity and second, externalized it too much, making themselves vulnerable and earning the wrath of Buddhists. Could you switch the slide, please? Thank you. Community leaders then started advocating for another process of reform. So this is a second process I'd like to draw your attention to. This time, it was to re-identify as an ethnic group, as Muslims, who had a well-established history in Sri Lanka and had made a significant contribution to the state. This identity does not undermine religion, but Islam is not the only marker. The second aspect of this change was to reduce visibility of Islam in the public space. For instance, by reducing symbols, um, Arabic name boards, uh, limiting practices such as multiple calls for prayer amplified from mosques in a particular proximity. Um, the third change was suppressing what I did have described it that happened in the first phase, which was a purification project. How he groups led emphasis on removing practices that were associated with the ethnic religious other, uh, removing them on the basis that they were shirk and bidda had faded out as Muslim national leadership recognized that this position caused damaging divisions within the community, and it validated Buddhist extremist claims of Muslim exclusivity. Similarly, heightened debates and discussions on what really is true Islam and what was shirk and bidda evolved into conversations on accommodating the religious and ethnic other. Um, some examples that Muslim uh, community leaders gave me was, for example, they would um, in, be involved in restoring and cleaning up Buddhist temples, uh, voluntarily doing this when there was, for instance, uh, a flood in a particular area. And as a goodwill gesture, they would go to the extent of restoring Buddhist idols and uh, restoring the temples in the knowledge that they would be used for worship. Now, whilst there's clearly a distinction between this and what the Tawhid groups categorized as shirk, where Muslims were accused of venerating or worshiping symbols and idols as part of Islam, it nonetheless symbolizes a significant shift in Islamic interpretation of the external and internal other. Islam remains omnipresent in this process too, as in the previous one, it is all encompassing. But in this instance, it's given a new image. The attempt to rebrand Islam, which is a critical aspect of this latest reform, has two features. One is to assert its integral closeness to Sri Lanka, and the second is to portray it as inclusive and peaceful. Now, the Easter Sunday attacks clearly challenged this position, but I have argued in my work that this was an oddity and has, hasn't really changed this reform process that's going to brand Islam as peaceful. What Islamic change is at times presented in the, sorry, let me start that again. Whilst Islamic change is at times presented in the literature as a novel and, more, and as being modern, as Francis Robinson has argued, they can be rooted in historical projects and processes. Aspects of both processes of change in Sri Lanka are not without historical precedents. Shunning the Indian influence and shifting to an Arabized Islam occurred, though all it amongst elites, in the 19th century. Very similar to what we saw happening in the 1990s, there was this shift in the 19th century. Converging with Buddhist cults and religious practice also occurred during the Portuguese and Dutch rule when Muslims moved into the Candian kingdom. So both these contemporary processes of change share some connectivity with events during colonialism. More so, both these processes of change to Muslim identity and religious practice have been in response to the ethnic and religious other. This has not been simply a consequences of, consequence of being a separate group in a divided ethno-religious context, but specifically, because Muslims are the second minority. Displacing as the distinct yet weak and problematic, displacing and the distinct yet weak and problematic ethnic categorization created and legitimized by colonial rulers, particularly the British, has continued to influence and shape Muslim identity and religious practice. 
Unlike the Tamils, who identify as a nation, Muslims have struggled to develop a strong sense of ethnic identity, with Islam playing a shifting role in shaping this identity. As a consequence, as my research found, Islamic thinking and practice has also adapted in response to the ethnic other. Whilst in the period Muslims have undergone these changes, other religious and ethnic groups have also transformed. None have been as stark, visible, and pronounced as what the Muslims have experienced. No doubt is identified transnational Islam, social economic factors, religious movements, and the country's conflict context have contributed to these. But the fragile ethnic identity and the complicated placing as the other, enabled by colonialists, has played a consistent and dominant role in these changes. I will end my presentation there. Happy to have it, questions and discuss more. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that uh, very, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, so, much, so much of it uh, also at the same time uh, recognizable, you know, from uh, these other con uh, contexts, the one I'm most familiar with, uh, the minoritization of Muslims uh, uh, in the 19th century North, North India. Uh, and, uh, you know, similar uh, emergence of revivalist movements and reform movements. Uh, it's such a recognizable uh, set of developments, such a recognizable uh, set of uh, events, um, as well as this, you know, the, all of these bizarre categories. Uh, I didn't know about uh, these bizarre uh, categories in, with the Moors, yeah, uh, which of course is a, a colonial term uh, for Muslims in any case. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these subtle distinctions that they come up with, <laughs> right? Uh, three, three different kinds of boars, right? Uh, so uh, they're, they're really, they belong in some kind of boar history. Uh, even in, I encountered the same when I visited South Africa, uh, these uh, very, very bizarre categories uh, that these people came up with uh, to divide people, which didn't. So, you know, over there, there would be a distinction between uh, coloreds and Indians and blacks and uh, how, so how is one supposed to distinguish between coloreds and uh, Indians, for instance, and how is one to distinguish? So, um, first of all, one must remark, uh, I think, uh, you know, this is also uh, two universities and many students are watching this. Uh, one must remark on the bizarreness because we have all adopted these languages, uh, which we've inherited from uh, colonial uh, from colonial rule, and we just take them for granted. But it's important to recognize that this is, uh, you know, uh, 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 an activity that many different colonial powers uh, carried out over, uh, you know, vast regions of the globe. Um, this is uh, the development of ethnographic governmentality. Yeah, uh, this is colonial ethnographic uh, state construction. In uh, in South Asia, it happened. Uh, particularly after the rebellion uh, of 1857, uh, the the uh, the British set up, you know, uh, an, an ethnographic state, yeah, uh, in all kinds of different departments of government, and this uh, very familiar. So, uh, if, uh, may I ask, when did the census take place? Uh, the first in census. In the 19th century, yeah, the first first census. When I'm sorry, the I wouldn't have that detail, but I do know that um, the classification happened. So the, we, we know that the debates existed in the 19th century, and the British adapted the term uh, by by the early 20th century. Okay. So quite late compared to what was happening in the rest of the subcontinent, quite late in the day, just prior to independence. And what's important, I mean, the thing I've sort of often thought about this back and forth in my head, because this is this was a this was a demand made by Muslims. The mm. manner in which the classification took place was heavily problematic, but it was a position that elite uh, Muslims demanded. As I showed you the quote from Ilam Abdulaziz, he made this case that they are Ceylon Moors of Arab origin and then the British accepted this quite quite easily. Um, so I've often thought 
and Muslims have had they had the opportunity even subsequently to you know to position themselves closer more closer with the Tamils if they wanted to but they have continued to maintain and want this distinct identity and that I think is to do with this complex position in Sri Lanka with the other ethnic groups and the country being in conflict. Mm. Uh, so I want so I, I just have uh, two uh, questions. Um, one, it struck me about the Hashemite uh, thing. So is there a memory uh, of that amongst contemporary that uh, that there's uh, that there's this claim? Who was the uh, the uh, that was Abdul Aziz? Yes. Who, yes. Who made that argument? Yeah. Uh, yes. Is there a memory of that claim that uh, the Hashemite uh, Islam is uh, represents a different kind of Islam? So from so I have to first qualify this. I'm not doing, I'm not from a historical background, but okay. my, I did have my PhD did focus on it, and there is um, there is I think what, there was one family that could be traced. So there was a British uh, document that was found that could trace one family um, with, which had origins in the, with, from the Hashimai clan, but that was about it. I don't think there was any, and, and from the historical evidence we have, it was not only Arab traders who were functioning in Sri Lanka. There was, you know, there, it isn't even clear which, uh, there was sort of West Asians, they were from Morocco, they were from very many different parts of the, the Middle East, that's what we call the Middle East now. There were also traders from uh, Kerala. So they were not, there were Arab traders who may have come directly to Sri Lanka, might have come via India. So mm. it was not clear where, where these groups originate from. It seems to have, they seem to have been a mix from all these different countries. So, but there was one British documentation that showed there was, that, that a, a family could be traced, linked back. Mm. Uh, but certainly that doesn't go to show that the entire population had that connection. Right. Uh, no, actually, I, what I was wondering was uh, whether, uh, not whether they were actually descended from the Hashemite clan, but uh, the idea that uh, the Hashemite uh, is, is Islam, quote unquote, because the category itself, I mean, that's the other thing I was about as you were speaking, uh, is that this, uh, it's the language itself, as has been remarked, the way in which these words uh, in the colonial context uh, assumed a different inflection. So even when we speak about Islam uh, in this way, as if it's some, as, as if it's a kind of object, uh, which you can, of course, it's uh, then shaped in various ways. Uh, so uh, the language itself is problematic. But the idea that uh, because it's in 1941, right? Abdul Aziz is speaking in 1941. In 1920s, I think, yeah. Oh, okay, 1920s. Uh, so yes, I mean the, the the vocabulary is already established by then uh, that there is this uh, other kind of is Islamic inheritance, yeah, uh, which is more. Uh, so the memory that trade uh, is is there that memory that trade was different from uh, jihad or whatever. Uh, well, sorry, just to correct myself, it was 1957, but Abdul. So quite late in the day, his response came, but. Um, this had been, so Abdul Aziz used, the quote I have co put there is after the, it had already been accepted, right? It, the more classification had already been accepted and this quote is of him kind of solidifying it. And there was a process that had been going through for many years in using this language. But I think what's important is the uh, profile of these leaders. They were also very, they were industrialists. They were in, some of most, most of them were in business. They had some kind of trading heritage themselves. They were economically powerful. Um, the ones, the political leaders who were speaking on that time on behalf of Muslims were in a very different position. So they did want to link to the, to the Arab traders and they wanted to differentiate from the newcomers, the Indian traders who had come much later compared to them who they saw as having come from the ninth century. So there was a lot of politics going on as well from within, from within the community. Right. And uh, the second question I had um, was, what is, it, uh, what is it that we do? I mean, I have some ideas on this, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. What is it uh, that we do when we show that uh, these things 
these uh, categories and the way in which politics is organized uh, have a colonial origin. Uh, what uh, what is the uh, what what is the point of such an exercise? Well, I think it's the it's where do we well I think it's not to take it for granted, isn't it? It's not to take that these um, are organically produced from the communities, or that they that this is to understand the the background, the the, the history behind it in order to be able to contest it, to better understand the dynamics, particularly in the sort of Sri Lankan context where they are, it's such a challenged position, right? It's, you have these three groups that are, have been competing in different ways. Muslims get sandwiched between the two other groups that have been in a conflict. And um, it's really critical to recognize what, that this is what I wanted to do from my presentation as well, to show that how these, look at where Muslims are today and look at the problems we're facing in Sri Lanka and look at the historical, looking, looking at it from a historical lens, you can kind of trace that where we are, the way Islam has had to shape, the way Muslims have had to shape their ethnicity and identity has been partly because of this problematic categorization. So it's to put things into context, I think, and to challenge it, but it's very difficult to do, particularly in the Muslim situation, because the Muslims are quite favored by the British, compared to the other two groups um, and so they have they're very very uncritical of the colonial position right so you'd find that um, they are in fact I think they're the least critical and you find that minorities generally had a better status under colonial rule towards the end particularly by the British and the, the singular Buddhist nationalism that Muslims are now facing the violent uh, uh, Sinhala Buddhist nationalism, the origins of Sinhala Buddhist nationalism came from um, anti-colonial struggles. So there is also that link there, right? So the kind of rhetoric that you hear uh, against Muslims now was developed first as an anti-colonial struggle. So it's very difficult, I think, to get the Muslim mindset to think through these things. Thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Father. I was, um, of course, we've talked about how, you know, this, this issue of how, um, in many ways, uh, Sri Lanka gives us a, a, an excellent example of how Islam is constructed in colonialism and also continues to be constructed after colonialism uh, through uh, arguably other forms of colonialism, such as Saudi colonialism, <laughs> for example. Um, but I, I, I guess. Um, some questions which came to mind were um, two contexts which um, might be a further element of this. And it, it seems certainly in, in recent times, um, as, as you know, we had a, a, a colleague um, in our department who did a dissertation, Amjad Salim, on, on the construction of, of, of Islam in, in modern uh, Sri Lanka. My friend, and, yes. Yes, and, and one of the points he was stressing was actually the the war and terror context was mm -hmm. extremely significant for how things have developed in the last 20 years. So um, uh, it might be interesting if, if you could comment on, on that context and how that related to the colonial um, inheritances. And, and the second uh, question I had was this wider issue of the relationship with, with Buddhists. So it seems that there clearly is some memory of a positive kind of interaction under the Kang Kandy Kingdom and, you know, in the early modern period. Um, but is that memory something which is productive? Uh, for example, is that used in, in post-conflict context to try and to sort of solve issues, to bring about um, peace building, so to speak? Uh, is that even used um, to deal with this wider issue? I mean, the issue is much bigger in Southeast Asia, you know, relations between Muslims and Buddhists are even more um, uh, extensively kind of critical in places like Myanmar, uh, you know, in other parts of Southeast Asia as well. So, um, you know, are there ways in which one can deal with this kind of memory of the relationship with Buddhists um, to deal with that? Especially since, you know, one of the points we often talk about when we're dealing with coloniality is this point about epistemicide and this kind of destruction of the knowledge or the memory of, Mm. relations and interactions which came before. Mm. 
So mm. those two, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the first question, I think, on the war on terror, I, it's sort of one of those things where you ask yourself, where do you start? Because it's, it's had a, and it's very complicated. So, so the war on terror in the Sri Lankan context has has uh, been used in multi has multiple dimensions, right? The first I would say was that it, uh, as it did in many countries, it enabled the Sri Lankan state to. Um, perpetrate violations and violence against ethnic minorities um, using the example of what the US did, right? So we have, uh, this is our war on terror and we have to fight it and we have to use any method and means to be able to do it, right? And um, again, this kind of uh, disregard to international norms and international human rights and humanitarian laws as was the case in the international sphere was replicated in Sri Lanka, right? But at that time, the, te the, the terrorist group, the militant group, the enemy was the Tamils, right? It was ethnic the biggest ethnic minority group. So the war on terror was used um, to justify that, that uh, the, the, the fighting and the, the, the violations that took place. And I didn't really mention it in detail, but I think it's quite well known that the Sri Lankan war ended quite brutally, right? With um, allegations of very, very serious allegations of war crimes, crimes against humanity, all of which have really met with very little investigation as a result of uh, using this arguments that the war on terror, this has been our war on terror, we've succeeded, at least we've just defeated the terrorists here. And now you don't come and tell us what to do and, and what laws we've broken kind of attitude. Now it's different with the Muslims and it's now been manipulated in a different way where Muslims are now seen as the enemy, right? And the possible terrorist group. And so in this case, you find now um, attempts to draw on experiences from the West on how to handle uh, Islamic radicalization. You, know, you have a number of different terms, extremism, radicalization, et cetera. And what really shocked me and I, I, when I uh, was researching on this soon after the Easter Sunday attacks was how, and this is also, we know this when we do uh, decoloniality and post-colonial studies of how international organizations, for instance, also replicate some of this, um, this, these methods, right? And what we saw, for example, was until the Easter Sunday attacks happened, interna international organizations, um, including the United Nations, for instance, was very concerned on justice for post-conflict atrocities, uh, for atrocities during the war and after, right? And the funding that was coming in, the projects were all to do with uh, justice and constitutional reform, peace building. Suddenly, Easter Sunday happens, and then you have all the focus change to studying Islamic radicalization, Islamic extremism, using the cases of Britain and the US and the West to find out what's going on in Sri Lanka. Money pumped in to do research on this and change this, uh, to try to understand this better. So it's very complicated, I think, in the Sri Lankan context in how it is used against both communities, right? On to your second question, I think um, in terms of memory, I think that Muslims have, held on to this, have really worked hard to hold on to this memory and present it. Um, it's often cited now. It's part of this second, what I call this rebranding of Islam, the second reform process where Muslims have uh, really tried to reconnect with the Buddhist population. They've talked, you find Muslim leaders and some moderate Buddhist leaders publicly reminding the population of this time. But you see this example is again now framed as Buddhist rulers being very, meritorious and kind to Muslims who are persecuted, opening their doors to them, bringing them in. It's not seen as oh, Muslims have always been an adaptable population. They adapted to your different uh, religious cultural positions and are now willing to adapt again. So the framing is the Buddhists have always been very open to Muslims and other minorities. We've in fact given them too much. They have their own laws They and and we haven't been strict enough, which is now led to this Islamic radicalization and these claims um, for, for, for extra rights and practicing of their own laws, et cetera. And therefore we need to get stricter and we need to subjugate them more. So that's the kind of narrative. But there, the memory exists um, within the Muslim community and it is brought out. 
Um, but it's one of the few of memories I think that exists in terms of of the relationship between the different communities. Right, we have a specific question uh, from Iftikhar Malik, our colleague in, in Bath. Um, I'll take the second one first, as the first one is a bit more specific, but it's about, um, says Sri Lankan, the Sri Lankan government for a time discouraged Islamists from the subcontinent coming into Sri Lanka for Tablir. I'm not sure if this is true or not anyway, but I noticed ongoing Maiman uh, connections given the sizable presence of Maimans in urban areas. Is this still the case? I think after the Easter Sunday attacks, the Sri Lankan government suddenly clamped down on, um, I, it, it was a really very, so what they did was they, they, the, they didn't have a clear enough picture as to what groups were doing what. So they branded all, the Tablighi Jamaat, the Jamaat Islam, they in fact arrested the head of the, the former uh, leader of the Jamaat Islam and the Jamaat Islam has always been about coexistence and uh, working with other religious groups and they've never been seen even as extremists but they branded all these groups the tablighi jamaat jamaat islam and the tawhid groups as extremists right so they were all considered to be extremists and they did clamp down for a while on um on these their leaders coming and they're still quite it's quite contentious when they can, do come and not but I'm not sure about the Maimans and what the connection to the Maimans are, but the Bora community, which is, um, they're, they're not Sunni, they're in fact, uh, as, as you know from the rest of South, South Asia, they're a mi Muslim minority in Sri Lanka. Their leader comes and is very, very popular and they, I think they have very good connections with the government, so they continue to have, be able to, for instance, have mass gatherings um, there was a slightly controversial attempt when their leader came and they are planning to have a mass gathering just as the pandemic was breaking out. So they seem to have a leeway with the Maimon. I don't know about them in terms of the religious leadership, but in terms of their control of the business community, they are still maintain good relationships with the government. I mean, actually, the, 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 the border communities in the wider area are a very interesting example of, of you know, in relations with governments and uh, kind of, uh, you know, keeping the integrity of, of a merchant community. But um, on, on the moment thing, I think perhaps one of the things that Iftikhaya might be pointing to is, um, you know, one of what is now perhaps the most important transnational movement is Dawat Islami, which is this massive Barilvi uh, outfit, uh, which is based in Pakistan, but is funded primarily by by Maimon communities in the Gulf. Um, and it would be interesting to see if there's any presence of that because they are increasingly quite an aggressive uh, Balilvi uh, movement. They are in terms, in financial terms, quite successful and, and influential. And that might be an interesting element of, you know, if they were to have a presence in Sri Lanka, you would expect them, for example, to support the Sufi orders, right? Um, and you'd expect them to kind of try to act as a as at least a pushback on some of these Salafi influences that's really interesting such that they have not come across them in my research and it's certainly something that you know you're pointing me to look towards the Mayaman community in Sri Lanka is tiny and they are very economically influential so for instance um Sri Lanka's what well, I think Sri Lanka's biggest income earner is out of garments like the rest of the many of the other South Asian countries and the biggest garment manufacturing company is owned by Maimans and I from my knowledge of them um, as with other you know even with the Sunni Muslims who are involved uh, who are very influential in business their religious positioning is never publicized they are very careful in how they manage um, so there's quite a clear division I think in terms of they, 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 they're very careful because they want to maintain their, you know, their business interests and their economical role. So they don't, they sort of stay away from controversy religiously, but it's certainly something to look into. If the Khaz, other question is very specific about Abdul Qadir Jalani and respect for elephants, but then maybe I can I kind of- I don't think I've ever <laughs> to answer that. Yeah. 
maybe I can ask the wider question, which is, of course, you know, the only thing perhaps I probably knew about Muslims in Sri Lanka was that there was a presence of the Qadiriya. So yeah. um, is that uh, still a significant factor? Because you did say that there's been quite a lot of a shift towards Salafis. Yeah. So, you know, how, how do we see the role of the Qadiriya? Do they still have any sort of social political role, do you think? Uh, so the Qad, the, of the four well-known Sufi groups, like I would say the Qadriyas were the biggest. Um, the Shaduliya is also quite big in Sri Lanka, but maybe second to the Qadriya. Um, and then you have the Nakshabandis and you have Rifaya, that's like a fourth group. So the Qadriyas were quite big um, and they still have kind of a dedicated presence. They have their mosque in the capital city, Colombo. I think they have lost a lot of influence there, um, as with all of these groups. So this was my PhD research and I sort of saw this wave, this shift, huge shift from all of them towards um, the kind of more Salafi Wahhabi thinking. And this was the success of the Tawhid groups because they particularly targeted these groups, you know, they was very, very clearly targeted the literature that the Qadri and the Shadaliya were using, including the Naqshbandis, they looked at their history, they targeted, they had plenty of lit, uh, magazines and they had these, they had the, these, these Maulid books, which these groups would read, translated into Tamil and Sinhalese and condemned for the places in which they, they, they claimed they were Shirk and Bida, et cetera. So these, these groups were really battered they were really battered in the sri lankan context through the 1990s now what happened is it's and it's this tragic and also interesting is that after easter sunday the many of these groups used this period to uh, when the easter sunday attacks happened muslims across the country were very shaken up right they could not believe that after having resisted any attempt to even remotely shift to violence throughout a 30 year armed conflict that nine boys could uh, organize themselves to commit this kind of atrocity, right? It was very shocking. Um, now there had been some evidence of it amongst the Muslim groups who had of, of course, as we know, reported it to the state intelligence and state authorities who did nothing about it. But apart from that, it was very difficult for the Muslim community to get a sense of it. But what did happen is you had the Sufi groups, the Qadriyas, the Shadaliya leaders coming up and speaking about um, how much they have been affected through the shift to Wahhabism and Salafism. You, they came out publicly. I think it it had a negative impact on, the, on Muslims broadly because it gave the uh, Buddhist extremists more ammunition to use against Muslims and so, there was this branding of this huge extremist shift and how even these moderate Muslims like who really belong to these groups were really badly affected. So you did have some revival, I would think. If not a revival, a space for the Sufi groups to be open and start to say, look, this, they, they, this is what we have suffered under this rising extremism and this has to stop. Um. Can I just ask I? a small, uh, very kind of procedural question about formal politics? And then we'll come to yeah, you. I can, we can yeah, try. I, I mean, you know, what often happens in kind of minority contexts, whether it's in India, one thinks also parts of Southeast Asia, is that when one talks about Muslims, you're often kind of mainly talking about these kind of Muslim gatekeepers, you know, elite individuals who become MPs, sometimes, you know, even become like ministers, etc. Is that the main kind of prison, prism through which, you know, the, um, the coloniality of the system continues? Um, is, is it still that case? Or is it uh, the case of that, um, that sort of elite level is being kind of eroded? Um, and so you don't have that sort of um, you know, uh, individuals who are representing the communities to the center and then uh, in reverse are also representing the state back into their communities? Um, it's an interesting question, a bit difficult to answer. I think it's complicated in the Sri Lankan context because of the conflict. So in the North and East, in the Tamil areas, you had, uh, in fact, this is the first, like the, the most 
well-known Muslim political party, the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress, came out of the eastern province, right? It came out of the conflict zone. And uh, none of them were from the capital Colombo elite kind of Muslim backgrounds. And it's, they still remain, remain popular, though they have now transformed into some elites themselves, right? Um, the traditional Muslim elites, it's also, again, depends on their kind of economic background. So the business elites kind shy away from politics often. They don't always get into politics. Politi the political elite in the capitals continue to remain. And certainly, as you say, they, they um, have a voice and you know, they're very much for, from the, their background is from the colonial legacy, yeah? But it's not so, it is complicated because you also had in the 80s and 90s this huge number of, of Muslims going as migrant workers and they came back with money. And that money changed that social economic position amongst the community. You had these movements like Jamaat Islam, Tablighi Jamaat, that were very grassroots level, right? And the kind of leadership that came out of them were not the typical Muslim elites. So I think there has been some contestation. Um, not, but having said that, the traditional elites still have a strong voice. But one of the changes also that the Tawhid group brought was in challenging that. The Tawhid group sort of, one of their arguments was that anybody could, any lay person could be a preacher, right? You didn't have to go to, the, they condemned this, the, the kind of Islamic education, uh, the madrasas that the Sufi groups uh, had, they said that they were kind of churning out people who were not proper Muslims, who who were practicing shirk and bidda. And if you, anyone, had the ability to read the Quran, understand it, look, will they give you translations of Quran in Sinhalese and Tamil, um, you can understand it and read it yourself, and you can challenge anyone. So it really created this lay movement of religious preachers, where everywhere you went, somebody thought they could go and break a tomb in a mosque or contest a, uh, another religious group because they that was they had that sense of empowerment. So I think it's quite complicated in the Sri Lankan context. No man. Yeah. So one of the questions, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I want to ask you is uh, about this, uh, the, the pessimism that you expressed about uh, being able to change people's minds about how they think of their uh, identities today. Uh, I, uh, you know, obviously I worry about that too, but uh, one of the purposes of a program like this is precisely uh, to get people to see uh, that in fact, so the question that I want to ask you is, uh, and really this is a question for uh, all of us, uh, uh, how might what, how might one go about apart from doing a program like this or the teaching that we do, uh, and what kind of uh, what kind of political changes would it require uh, uh, for this colonial inheritance uh, to be overcome, as it were? It's. Uh, I know it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. It's a very difficult one, I think, because of the post-conflict context in Sri Lanka, where identity, you know, because it was, you know, an ethnic conflict, identities became contested, yet entrenched as well. So contested, challenged, and entrenched, and problematized, um, and there's so much, so much resentment and anger between the different groups that where the focus now is on reconciliation coexistence it's hard i think for in in the sri lankan context to look beyond that perhaps i think what is what is possible to do is to if you focus on the on the colonial legacy you might actually have a unifying um unifying kind of framing right a unifying theory behind all to break through beyond it but each of the groups are so, sort of struggling to survive at the moment at some level. So to kind of get beyond it, um, it's certainly, I think it's very valid and it's important and we need to start thinking about it. And I, you know, I'm very glad that this kind of discussion exists. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something I'd quite like to take, take away and discuss with other Sri Lankan academics. Um, but it's very hard, the time and space 
this is it doesn't seem to exist at the moment right i mean the thing is you know this purifying islam thing yeah which is of course uh, happening all over the place yeah uh, it's literally a kind of self ethnic cleansing yeah which is what i kind of <laughs> Described it as this sort of a separatism, right? It was while you're in the conflict, it was a Sri Lanka Muslims' own internal separatist struggle. They were kind of trying to, like what was happening in the country, they were trying to have their own separate identity and they were cleansing their internal other. So they were, I, I see what you're saying. But just to give you some sense of the present context in Sri Lanka, I don't know how much you have read, but for instance, Muslims have been seriously targeted. Um, as a result of the pandemic, right? Through policies um, following the pandemic. And they have been blamed and accused whenever there's been a rise in the cases of uh, spread of coronavirus. And they are constantly being targeted by these Buddhist nationalist extremist groups and the government um, in the context of the pandemic. And one of the most awful uh, consequences of this, and I don't know if you know about this, but the government in April, uh, came up with a forced cremation policy. So they came there, the one, I think the only, one of the only countries in the world that has insisted that every COVID-19 yes. victim has to be cremated. Um, and the Muslim community has really risen up against this. And they have, uh, you know, you've had civil society activists, you have had so many people trying to work to convince the government that uh, there's no scientific evidence for this. The WHO has written to them, the UN has written to them and said there's no scientific evidence for this. Muslims can be buried if they want to. They, their own scientific advisors have said so, but they're resisting this. And what is tragic is that more than half, so Sri Lanka has a 9% Muslim population, but more than half those who have died of COVID-19 and been cremated are Muslims. So there's a real issue at the moment for Muslims. They're, I would say they're terrorized by this because it's so personal to them that they have been don't have to face this. The fear is very, very distinct. So, in, you know, when you're on an everyday basis trying to deal with things like this, it's very difficult to to bring up conversations um, that we might be able to in in a safer space in in the kind of academic with, with the privileges we have um, to as academics to be able to talk about. And I think one of the challenges is in time to be able to merge these, right? Like whilst the, we are dealing with survive, everyday survival issues and uh, problems to do with identity and complications to do with human rights violations, how do we also look at these bigger pictures because they are linked together? Thank you. I think that's a, that's a very important point because, you know, often, um, you know, critique which is sometimes made of, of decoloniality is precisely, well, how does it make a difference in the real world, right? Uh, and how do we deal with the actual, uh, not sort of structural kind of so-called objective violence, but how do you deal with the actual subjective violence that so many people face in everyday life? So I think, you know, trying to bring some of that decolonial thought, uh, a praxis into, into, um, into reality, into the social reality that we have is, is a really important challenge that we all face. And it's, it's I think, is something that we really need to, um, to be prioritizing as we move forward. Um, you know, a di diagnosis of an issue, uh, a suggestion of options, which decoloniality raises, and then how do you bring that into praxis um, so that you actually affect everyday lives and you don't just continue um, these rather safe, as you said, very, very, very safe, academic, closed ivory tower discussions, which unfortunately too much decolonial study sometimes does come across as being. Uh, I mean, I, I accept they're very critical. They are critical and important, but I, I, like, I, yeah, I don't have to just to repeat myself. It's very difficult because we, you know, the, when the actual context back home is different, isn't it? Yeah, I think that that point is well taken. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there are any I think other questions should... which have come through. I can't see anything. Yeah, I, I, there, there aren't any others. Okay. I think we can close. Do you have any last points in Oman that you'd like to raise? Uh, not really. Thank okay. you. Uh, I think it's been a, a very, lot... very 
extensive yeah, discussion, not, hasn't it? Not, lots to think about from, uh, you know, uh, these are difficult questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, but thank you so much for that uh, uh, rich talk. And yes, discussion. thank you. And especially, as I said right at the beginning, because often you know, when we talk about South Asia, we, we miss out Sri Lanka. Yes, I know. <laughs> and, I think I've been on the case, particularly with the Institute, that uh, I think in lots of the discussions around this, even in the Muslim minority context, Sri Lanka gets missed out. And then in South Asia, Sri Lanka gets missed out with Muslims. And, and particularly now more than ever, because uh, Muslims in Sri Lanka are facing a very challenging time, I think it's really important that we man maintain discussions. So I'm very grateful to be invited to speak. Um, I think a lot of the content has challenged me, got me to think, because as I said, this is not my background. And um, it's been really helpful. And um, it's certainly an area I'm very interested in. So I can see some pathways opening up as well. So thank you very much for having me. No, thank you very much for, for presenting. Um, that just le leaves me um, beyond thanking Farah and those who've been watching, just to remind you that our next seminar in two weeks time, same time, same place, uh, will be with Professor Manakia from Colombia, who will be taking a slightly back in time uh, and looking at uh, political ethics um, under the, the Mughals in the late Mughal period. Um, so in a sense, we'll be jumping a bit to the colonial or the pre-colonial past. So uh, thank you again, everyone who's been uh, listening and thank you, Farah. Thank you.